Hey guys, Mr. Klein here discussing the lesson on how are minerals identified, Chapter 3, Lesson 2 in your textbook. Uh, the questions we are going to be discussing today, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to answer these correctly. Number one is, why is it necessary to use more than one property of mineral identification? And question number two, where we're going to spend most of today's lesson on, is what are properties you can use to identify minerals? So let's get going with this. Okay, first off, scientists who study the distribution of minerals, mineral properties, and their uses are known as mineralologists. And mineralologists have identified simple steps to help classify unknown minerals. These tests are based on physical and chemical properties of the minerals that we're looking at. Now, at the beginning, you might be thinking, well, if a, a rock is red and a rock is green, they might be, they're might they obviously different. And this, this rock is red and this rock is red, so it must be the same. Well, here's the thing. Color alone cannot be used for mental identification because oftentimes differences in color can be in the same type of mineral and also the same mineral like I just said, can have different colors, and not only that, minerals of the same color might be radically different. Because oftentimes variations in color reflect the presence of different types of impurities or different elements or compounds within the crystalline structure to give off a color. Now here's what I'm talking about as I go on to this next slide. Okay, at the top, all four of these, these two smoky colored, this clear one, and then this rose colored one are all the same mineral. They're all quartz. Okay, if we do physical and chemical tests on them, we see they're all quartz, even though they all have different colors. And at the bottom, we have two minerals that look kind of alike, olivine and pyroxenite. They both have the same green color, and they both have grayish rocks in there, but they both have radically different chemical structures, even though they have the same color. So it's, we need to have other tests in order to figure out whether minerals are correct or the same type or not. So let's look at some. Number one, luster is the way the mineral reflects or absorbs light at its surface. Okay, so how, how shiny something is, is its luster. For example, metallic luster is the shiniest luster of them all. Okay, uh, most metals will have this type of luster, some greater, some lesser. And non-metallic minerals might have a shiny luster, but most are not. As a result, they're not reflective like metal. And minerals that lack shiny luster have an earthy, or what we call a dull luster. If we look at this slide, here's two types of luster. Okay, gypsum is a dull or an earthy luster. As you can see, the picture's taken. Not much shines off of it. You see the light shining on it, but nothing's reflecting back. Where on the other side, you see galena, which is where we can get lead from. It has quite shiny or a metallic luster. Now, so luster is one type of test that we can use to see how a mineral reflects off. And here's another time. Uh, for example, streak testing a streak is the color of the mineral in powder form. Streak testing can be produced by rubbing a mineral across an unglazed porcelain plate. Okay, porcelain, the material that's used in plates and uh, china and things of that nature. Now, streaks only used for identifying minerals that are softer, and there's nothing on this line, by the way, than porcelain. Okay, for the example on the page before, if we were to do a streak test of quartz, all these four types, you would have the same streak. And if you pulled these two out of the ground and you thought they looked the same, the olivine and pyroxenite, you could do a streak test and determine they're both very different minerals. Okay? Now some metallic minerals can vary in color, but like I said, the streak color is always the same. Okay, so first off, luster reflectiveness. Next is the streak or the color of the mineral in a powdered form. You either scrape it across porcelain, so what we do most of the time, or another time we can just grind it down and see what comes up. Now, what we have next is really important. Okay, the hardness of a mineral is its resistance to being scratched. Okay, this is really important. And the scale that we use to measure hardness is the Mohs hardness scale, named after German mineralogist Friedrich Mohs. Okay, it's on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the weakest, in other words, the easiest to be scratched, and talc is the example of that, going all the way up to 10, where a diamond has that hardness. 
Okay, so the Mohs hardness scale goes from 1 to 10, talc is at 1, diamond's at 10. Okay, and for every step you go up from there, every number that's above it can scratch what's below it. And so here's an example of the scale that we can look at. And it's a really good idea if you memorize all 10 of these in order. One is talc, two is gypsum, three is calcite, four is fluorite, five is uh, apatite, six is feldspar, seven is quartz, eight is topaz, nine is corundrum, and 10 is diamond, okay? Here's some other common materials and see where they lie on the Mohs scale. Okay, your fingernail has a Mohs hardness scale number of 2.5, which means t it can scratch talc and gypsum, but it can't scratch calcite. Okay, a penny has the same hardness as calcite. In other words, it can scratch talc and gypsum, and it can scratch your fingernail, but everything else above it can scratch it. Uh, an iron nail has 4.5 on the scale. In other words, it's in between fluorite and apatite. And glass is at 5.5, which is between apatite and feldspar. Okay, feldspar can scratch glass, as can quartz, topaz, corundrum, and diamond. Diamond can scratch everything on here. Talc can scratch none of it. Okay, so make sure you know these. The Mohs hardness scale. Talc, gypsum, calcite, fluorite, apatite, feldspar, quartz, topaz, corundrum, and diamond. Okay, this is really important. You'll see it on the test that you're going to take when we do minerals and rocks. You're going to have it on your six-week assessment. You will have it on the LEAP. It's one of those important things in geology that you need to know. So we've talked about luster, which is a reflectivity. We've talked about streak, what it looks like, a uh, mineral looks like in powder form, and its hardness. So let's look at some other things. Now, the arrangement of atoms and the strength of the bonds between atoms determine how a mineral breaks. Okay? And if a mineral breaks with a smooth, flat, flat surface, that's because the bonds between ions and atoms are really strong. And if it breaks with a smooth, flat surface, we have what's called cleavage. Stop your laughing. Okay, we're, ta we're not talking about that. We're talking about how minerals break. A good example of that is halite or the rock salt. If you were in my class that I showed you how the halite broke, it broke at 90 degree angles on flat surfaces. Now. If a mineral does not have cleavage, if it breaks to form uneven surfaces or it breaks in random patterns, it has what we call fracture. Okay? Cleavage is if you have strong atomic bonds, fracture is if you have weak atomic bonds. Some minerals will fracture into splinters or fibers. For example, asbestos is a mineral that was used in in old fire retardant gear, in other words, to stop the spread of fire, and it was found to be uh, able to cause lung cancer, so it's being pulled out of old buildings and things like that. But if, asbestos, when you break it, it breaks into fibers like hair or, or cloth looking like. Now, on the other hand, some might break with smooth and curved surfaces. Okay, so here let's look at an example of cleavage and fracture. On the left you have halite, rock salt. It breaks in smooth, predictable patterns at right angles. And this quartz on the right breaks and forms uneven surfaces, usually spreading out from the point of impact. If you were to drop quartz or you were to break quartz, or it would show like bulletproof glass where it radiates out, okay? As you can see right there, it radiates out from the point of impact and the lines are uneven and you might see this in glass. If glass is formed and you look at the bottom of a glass, you might see waves and things like that. That would be considered, if it broke, it would be considered fractures. And if you drop quartz and it breaks, it doesn't break into nice even spots. It just breaks all over the place. Okay? So cleavage and fracture is a way we can measure how it breaks. And remember hardness, luster, and streak. Now, another way we can determine whether a mineral is different or not is on its density, or the mass of the object divided by its volume. If someone holds two minerals that look the same, the one that feels heavier has what we call a greater density. It has more. In general, whenever we talk about minerals and elements in particular, okay, the greater the atomic number, usually the greater density it will have because there's more atomic mass to it. Okay, And here's another way we can touch and figure out uh, how a mineral can be classified is through its texture, how it feels. 
Oftentimes you'll feel rocks that will feel nice and smooth if they're not polished, if they are naturally smooth. Some of them feel real rough. Some of them have a lot of powdery feel to them. For example, graphite or pencil lead, if you were to take a pencil, take the lead out and grind it down into a streak powder, you notice it feels really greasy. And that's because of its physical properties. And graphite is oftentimes used as a lubricant in order to keep things moving, like in gears and bearings, because it's not wet, it's dry. That greasy feel allows things to move with lesser friction. Okay, so let's head into the home stretch of this lesson. Here's cleavage and fracture again. Notice the right angles on halite, the uneven break of quartz. And let's look at this. Calcite will fizz when it comes in contact with hydrochloric acid. So what I have is I have a short video right here. Let's look at that. We'll watch that video in a second. Okay, and so let's watch as calcite is put on the hydrochloric acid. The acids drop it and immediately forms uh, carbon dioxide bubbles. Okay, so that's if we see a bunch of white, you know, powdery substances. Oh, is it calcite? Is it talc? Is it gypsum? Well, we can do a chemical test with hydrochloric acid to determine whether it is or not. Calcite will bubble, the other ones will not. Now some minerals are magnetic due to the presence of iron in their chemical formulas. Okay, not all metals are magnetic, but all magnetic items are metals. Okay, they usually have some form of iron and magnetic forces act upon them. Finally, fluorescence is a mineral's ability to glow when exposed to ultraviolet light. So let's go back and look at this. This is fluorine. Fluorite, rather. Okay, fluorite has a green glow. Okay, if you notice like that. And watch what happens whenever we expose fluorite to an ultraviolet light. Okay, it glows. Okay, if you ever put a black light over fluorite, it will show a different color like that. Okay, so notice this is what it looks like under regular light. This is what it looks like in ultraviolet light. So, Let's go ahead and let's wrap up this lesson by looking at the two questions we were going to answer. But in this lesson, you should have been able to answer the following questions correctly. Number one, why is it necessary to use more than one property for mineral identification? Because oftentimes, minerals might have same properties on one type of test, but they might be different on other ones. For example, example, talc and gypsum might be relatively low on the Mohs scale, and they're both white in color, just like calcite, but if we use a hydrochloric acid test, we'd be able to tell the difference between calcite and the other two. Or we can check the hardness of talc and gypsum and figure out the difference between the two there. And what are properties you can use to identify minerals? Well, we talked about luster, which is the way the mineral reflects or absorbs light at its surface. Streak, the color of the mineral in powdered form. Its hardness, the resistance of the mineral to being scratched. How it breaks, if it breaks in smooth flat surfaces it has cleavage. If it breaks unevenly, uh, it will be a fracture. And of course then there's the density, which is the mass of the object divided by its volume. And then how it feels is its texture, or whether it has magnetism, or even its ability to glow when exposed to ultraviolet light. I hope this lesson informed you got over any misconceptions, you did not have the, any, uh, the, any of the concepts, and remember if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or ask me a question in class and I will take care of it. Talk to you later.